M Tech student at IIT Madras. On behalf of Vande Matram family, I would like to welcome our chief guest of the day, Sri Sandeep Balakrishna, to our campus. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to the faculty members, students, and others present here. Vande Matram is delighted to invite you to the lecture. The Lost Geography of Bharat by Sri Sandeep Balakrishna, author, writer, speaker, editor on this special occasion. I am reminded of a Sanskrit shloka from Vishnu Puran. Uttaram yat samudrasya himadresh chaiva dakshinam varsham tad bharatam nama bharati yatra santatihi, which means the country that lies north of the ocean and south of the snowy mountains is called Bharatam and there dwell the descendants of Bharata. I request that our chief guest assume his place on the stage. We will now play the iconic and inspiring song, One Day Matharam, a composition that resonates with the heartbeat of Bharat. One Day Matharam, which translates to I bow to the motherland, encapsulates the love and reverence for our motherland. Written by Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay ji, this timeless composition is a celebration of rich heritage, diversity and the undying spirit of freedom of Bharat. We have proudly followed this tradition of singing the national song at the beginning of every event of our Vande Mataram. Therefore, I invite here to raise and join Ishan Kulkarni to sing our national song. Vande Mataram Vande Mataram Sujalam Sufalam Malaya Jashitala Sasya Shamala Mataram Vande Mataram Shubra Jotsna Ulakitaya Mini Ulaka Sumita Drumadara Shobhini Suhasini Sumadhura Bhashini Sukhadam Varadam Mataram Vande Mataram Vande Mataram Ishanji a short introduction of our team Vande Mataram. The Vande Mataram Forum at IIT Madras aspires to take initiatives that introduces and sensitizes the student community about Bharat's rich cultural, economical, socio-political, scientific and technological heritage, its ramifications today and the thoughts about the roadmap ahead. The shloka from Ramayana Janani Janma Bhumishcha Swargadapi Gariyasi, which means that mother and motherland are superior to heaven, is the philosophy that has kept us going ahead for the last eight years in this institute and has strengthened our national consciousness. Now, we request Professor Ravi Kumar to present book. Uh, our guest with a fruit basket and welcome him for the program. Thank you, Professor Ravi Kumar. Now, an uh, introduction of a speaker. Sri Sandeep Balakrishna Avaru is an Indian author, columnist, and a political commentator. He has written on various topics, including Indian politics, culture, and history, in both English and Kannada. Sandeep Balakrishna 
has been an information technology professional for over 15 years. He's a regular columnist at The Pioneer, Kannada Prabha, and on various online media like SIFI and Center Right India. He has been running the rediscovery of India blog for about 14 years now. One of his notable works is the book entitled titled Tipu Sultan, The Tyrant of Mysore, in which he presents a critical perspective on the historic figure Tipu Sultan, who was the ruler of the kingdom of Mysuru in the late 18th century. His Madurai Sultanate, a concise history, is a brief history of the Madurai Sultanate that existed in South India in the early to middle part of the 14th century. The book explores the political and military conditions that existed in both North and South India and provides a compelling narrative of the circumstances that led to the establishment of the Madurai Sultanate. It also traces the vacillating fortunes and the eventual demise of the Madurai Sultanate. Others include invaders and infidels, the Khalji devastation of infidel Devagiri, 10 lessons from Hindu history in 10 episodes, tales of grit, heroism and valor, stories from inscriptions, 70 years of secularism, a day in the life of a chapati, dhutha kavya and many others. He has translated the legendary Kannada novelist Dr. S.L. Bhairappa's path-breaking bestseller Avarana into English as Avarana the Wheel, now in its 12th reprint. His translation of Dr. S.L. Bhairappa's Tabbaliyu Neenade Magane in English as Orphaned was published recently. Sandeep is also the founder and editor of the Dharma Dispatch, an online journal dedicated to the Indian civilization, culture, and history. He is a contributing editor of Preksha Journal, a niche online magazine focused on Indian culture and philosophy. It is indeed our honor to have him delivering a lecture today. So I request Dr. Sand Shri Sand Sandeep sir to continue with. Namaste and a very, very good evening to all of you. My good friend out here, uh, you know, gave out a very generous and I must say exaggerated introduction about uh, me. So you can set that aside. And uh, at the outset, I'd like to express my uh, heartfelt gratitude to the entire wonderful team of Vande Mataram for organizing this event. And uh, my heartfelt thanks also go out to, especially to Sri Jiva and uh, his uh, friends for the graciousness and hospitality. And needless, it is my honor and great privilege to address this uh, gathering at one of the finest educational institutions of uh, India. And uh, on that note, we can begin. And uh, Sohan, I think, has set the uh, tone, which is highly befitting, given the topic at hand today, uh, with the rendition of a national song, Vande Mataram. So let's see how this goes. We can begin with this uh, timeless, eternal, extraordinary verse in the entire uh, Upanishadic or philosophical darshanic corpus of India. Om Eshava Asya Midagam Sarvayat Kincha Jagat Yan Jagat Tena Tetena Bunjita Magradakasya Svidhanam. So, as all of you know, this shloka is from the Isha Vasya Upanishad and it is also a rather appropriate way to begin today's topic and uh, I'm sure most of you out here are familiar with the meaning of this profound uh, shloka but I'll just give it just what it basically means is that the whole world is the abode of Ishwara and when we realize this simple truth it will evoke within us an attitude of renouncement and we let go of our attachment to worldly things. And so this Upanishad says that because the world is the abode of Ishwara, do not covet the wealth of other people. But in the context of today's topic, 
the first line of this shloka is relevant to us. In just 16 alphabets, it reveals an eternal truth. And when we say, Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam, it means that everything in this world, in the entire creation, automatically becomes sacred. Nothing is outside the ambit of divinity and everything falls within its purview because Isha Vasya, meaning Isha Avasya, the home of Ishwara, has no boundaries. <clears throat> and this shloka is also a quick way, quick and easy way to understand how our tradition has always regarded the physical geography of India. It regards it as a sacred geography. Uh, this thing is kind of locked out. So, like I said, our tradition has always regarded the physical geography of Bharata Varsha as a sacred geography. In fact, there are literally thousands of th such shlokas in both the Vedic and other sacred literature of Bharata Varsha, but I will mention a representative line that shows this ideal of a sacred geography. This occurs in the Nadi Sukta of the Rigveda, and here's a small sample from it. Amita me Nadi tame Devi tame Saraswati. I'll come to this. But what this basically means is that all our rivers are regarded as a mother who nourishes her child. And this ideal of India's sacred geography becomes clearer when we contrast how other countries historically regarded their geography. Couple of examples. For example, at the height of its power, Nazi Germany and communist USSR, they regarded their countries as the fatherland. And this sanctity attached to Bharata Varsha also has, you know, literally infinite dimensions. Uh, for example, most of us are familiar how we regard our land, our geography, as a Punya Bhumi, Matra Bhumi, Pavitra Bhumi, Karma Bhumi, Dharma Kshetra, and so on. And when we pause and think about the meaning of these profound words, we find that they all have their roots in the same divine impulse and ideal that is embodied in the Isha Vasya Upanishad. Unfortunately, today we have all but forgotten a key element in our social and cultural history, the fact that for centuries, our civilization, our people took extraordinary pride in their geography. This pride today is limited to singing patriotic songs glorifying our motherland. But when we, you know, today even read poems and songs and our entire corpus of literature and how our people lived and how they regarded this physical space of this land will be stunned it is, you know, eye-opening to say the least. So I'll, I, offhand I can recall a verse which was uh, authored by an unknown, uh, his name is lost to us. Uh, he was a poet uh, uh, who lived in medieval times and what it basically says, let me be born as a tree, let me be born as a shrub, let me be born as a plant, let me be born as a pebble or let me be born as a worm even, but let me be born in Bharata Varsha. It is a great prayer actually. So we celebrated the sanctity and the greatness of our land in numerous shlokas in our Puranas, Dharmashastras, Ramana and Mahabharata. There are entire volumes written by great scholars tracing the geographical locations and uh, you know various associations with it derived out of Ramayana and Mahabharata. These are, you know, they run into literally thousands of uh, pages. If you are interested, they are all available in archive.org. Pity is that we don't read them. Now, let us approach this from a different direction. Think about why a professor, a Harvard professor named Diana Eck, she's written several famous books. One of her uh, most recent books is India as Sacred Geography. Think 
you know, she could have given any title to the book. She could have said India, sacred history, uh, you know, India something, whatever, India and Indians, whatever. Why did she choose to call it India a sacred geography? She chose the word sacred deliberately because like all foreigners writing on India, she also understood a fundamental point that sanctity comes naturally to Hindus. And one of the greatest celebrations of this sacred geography is a grand passage that occurs in the Matsya Purana. It is a, that section is called the Mahasankalpa. This, how many of you are married here? Okay. Yeah, yeah, married. Okay, now the number of hands have increased. I'll ask once more. How many of you are married here? Okay, that's better. So why I ask this question is that uh, this Mahasankalpa portion that occurs in the Matsya Purana, even today it is recited during the Kanyadanam ritual in the weddings. And this Mahasankalpa is actually indicative of an extraordinary civilizational and cultural continuity that is unparalleled anywhere in the world. The Mahasankalpa is in many ways actually a mini encyclopedia. It is also an atlas, it is also a, an almanac, a calendar. And in our context today, the geographical details and lists that it gives about the physical geography of India is relevant. For example, it lists the names of uh, mountains, forests, rivers, islands, grooves, kingdoms, places of pilgrimage and other great cities and towns and I'll just read out uh, a small portion from it. Anga Vanga Kalinga Kashmira Kamboja Kamarupa Kerala Kekeya Kosala Maithila Kuntala Kuranga uh, Kuranga Kuravaka Savira Saurashtra Matsya Magada Malava Marala uh, Simhala Malayala Chola Bangala Panchala Salava uh, Pulindra Karnataka Vara, uh, Varataka Marataka Sikka Sindha uh, Pancha, uh, Panchavika Pavaka uh, Panda Pandya Dravida Yavana Shura Sena Gurjara Kukura Parashara Gandhara Vidarbha Barbara Barama Boja Balhika uh, Konkana Tenkana uh, China Huna Dasharnadi Shat Panchashadesha. This is a list of 56 deshas which is included in the Mahasankalpa. In this context of this uh, Mahasankalpa, the word desha must be considered as an indicative of the Indian geography of that period, say roughly about 1000 years or so, 600, 700,000 years or so. Uh, not to be considered, desha does not mean country in this context. It is a unit of geography. And a similar but a slightly different list is also available in a work titled Sapta Panchashat Desha, which also lists 56 countries. And apart from all such works, at a very, very broad level, there was a popular method for identifying the various uh, constituents of our geography right from the ancient and up to the late medieval period, this was given using a broad five-fold classification. The first was the Madhya Desha, which is a middle or center, roughly corresponding to today's Madhya Pradesh and surrounding regions. The Udicha Desha, or roughly the northwest of the Sindhu River. The third is the Pracha Desha, which is the eastern part of India, including today's West Bengal, Bangladesh and that region. Dakshinapata, which is southern India, and Aparanta, or the western border, starting all the way from Gujarat and going up. Now, generally speaking, even the ancient and early medieval Chinese, they adopted the same classification scheme that I just read out for describing India's geography. They called these five divisions as the five Indies. This five-fold classification has largely been retained even today. You can verify this for yourself by reading the government gazetteers written in Indian languages. The same classification has been maintained 
for what, nearly 2,000 plus years. I'll come to that. Now, uh, I had to give this kind of longish geographic introduction and a rather uh, philosophical backdrop. It was necessary because, as we all know, geography and history are inseparable. Geography dictates and directs and shapes history, and history alters maps, which is why geography is also memory. Just like how history is memory, geography is also memory. And loss of physical geography is also loss of memory. This is a loss of civilizational, cultural, social, traditional, and most importantly for our times, it is a loss of narrative memory. Which is why I have titled my topic as the lost geography of Bharat. Because Bharata Varsha has permanently lost a substantial geography and therefore it has also lost substantial narrative memory, perhaps forever, actually forever. But in hindsight, it would be more accurate to call today's topic as the forgotten Hindu history of Pakistan. So, over the space of uh, this lecture, I can, this is a very broad topic, you know, very detailed topic. What I can do at best is to offer only a few broad outlines of this narrative memory loss because the subject is enough to fill three or four volumes, averaging about 500 pages each. And when I say Pakistan, I also include Afghanistan and Bangladesh. And when I say the Hindu history of Pakistan, I also include Jain, Buddhist, Sikh, and all other offshoots of Sanatana Dharma, basically any school, any philosophy, any sect, any mark, any pantha that originated on this soil. They are all Sanatana. And in sketching out this forgotten history, I have divided my topic into uh, a few broad categories, which is, uh, one second. Yeah, few broad themes, which includes, uh, as you can see on the slide, civilization and cultural, sacred or spiritual, some eminent personalities, geographical, including, say, commercial or business centers, and last but not the least, education, all of which are now, I repeat, in the Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh regions. And these themes actually are, uh, you know, they have lots of overlaps, but and they intersect at various points, but I've used them for the sake of convenience. So we can begin with what I call the lost geog geographies. And the first place to start is with the oldest surviving literary and spiritual work of mankind, which is the Rig Veda. Let's look at a beautiful verse from the Rig Veda. It says, Imam me gange yamune saraswati shutu dristo magam sachata parushniya asikniya marudhradiye vitatastayar jikiye shrunukya sushomaya tushta maya pratham amyatave Sajo Susarpa Rasaya Shvetayataya Tavam Sindho Kubhaya Gomatim Kramum Mohantva Saratam Yabiri Yase. What does this shloka basically say? It is basically a list of 20 rivers that existed in Bharata Varsha of the Rigvedic period. That is all this is. This is a list of 20 rivers, but of course you use this in yagnas and pujas meant for the appropriate occasion. But for this purpose, this is what it is. A list of 20 rivers that existed during the Rigvedic period. Now the question arises, how many of these rivers 
are in the truncated India of today? The answer to that we we'll look at you know uh, over the course of a few slides. How many of these rivers are in the truncated part of India today, either partially or fully? In no particular order, we have lost the following rivers permanently to Pakistan. Number one, Indus or Sindhu, Ravi, whose original name is Iravati or Parishni, it occurs in the shloka. Satlej, whose original name is Shutudri, Jilam, whose original name is Vitasta, Five, Chenab, whose original name is Asikni, and a good portion of the ancient Panchanada Kshetra, the five rivers, Panchanada Kshetra or Punjab, that is where it gets its name from. Punjab, the original name of Punjab was Panchanada Kshetra. A good portion of this ancient Panchanada Kshetra is now in Pakistan, the Punjab portion of Pakistan. Now, let's look at uh, a map that shows this. So as you can see, these uh, Rigvedic rivers, which are now in uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, so you see Vitasta, Su uh, Sushama, Parushni, Shutudri, uh, Vitasta, Saraswati, which is kind of dried up, and uh, Yavyavati, Gomati, uh, Kurrum, which was Krumu, Kubha, which is in Afghanistan. Now. Uh, just for the sake of a few examples, I've considered uh, some rivers, and we look at that in the next slide. So there is a curiously named river called Zob. It has really no meaning. But it's, it is in Baluchistan now. Its original name is Yav, uh, Yavyavati, which also occurs in that verse in Rigveda. Yavyavati, which is called Zob. So you see the kind of loss that has occurred. Even if you go to the inhabitants of, you know, in and around this Zob river and ask the original name, they won't be able to say that. Forget them. Lots of scholars in India only won't be able to know this, the history of this river. And uh, after Zob, we can come to Gomati or Gomal river. This, not, this should not be confused to the Gomti flowing in Uttar Pradesh. This was the original uh, Gomati river, which is now called Gomal. Thankfully, they have preserved some linguistic similarity. This is called Gomal and it is located near the Rehman Dairy in Pakistan. And uh, the next river is something called Kurram River, uh, which is in the Kurram district, again in Pakistan. And after this, you have the next river, which is Kuba or the Kabul River. In fact, the name, uh, the, the, the name of Kabul comes from the river Kuba. It is again a Rigvedic uh, uh, river. And uh, so just to kind of sum it up, you can understand what has happened when you once again look at the map of the Rigvedic uh, uh, rivers. This helps us get a clearer idea of the geographical spread of these ancient rivers that we have permanently lost. And it is actually a compound loss. It is a geographic loss as well as a loss of their original names. And these name changes uh, is a point that uh, you know I'll come to later. So this, I hope you get an idea of you know, the extent of the loss. Now, let me read out a brief list from the 56 deshas uh, that I had mentioned earlier. And of these 56 deshas, we have permanently lost the following. Large parts of Vanga Desha, which is undivided Bengal, they are now, we have lost it to Bangladesh. The original region of Gurjara and Saurashtra region included the renowned Shakti Pita, Hingulaja, today known as Hinglaj Mata, which is in Pakistan, Balochistan province. This is permanently lost. It was once part of the undivided, very vast region of the Gurjara Saurashtra region. Today, Saurashtra is a small district in the Gujarat state. 
नेक्स्ट कम्स काम्भोजा एट वेरियस पॉइंट वन सेकेंड at various points the kambhoja region was located between undivided punjab and to the south of it uh, and to the south of the balkh region which was known as very ancient region it was its original name is balhika or valhika which occurs in both ramayana and mahabharata today it was uh, now it's called balkh until recently we all know of alexander uh, alexander's campaign where he passed through a place called bactria original name is valhika now except a small part in punjab this entire kambhoja region is permanently lost next sakala or sagala this is the original name of a city called sialkot in pakistan uh next is vakranta it is known as the makran which is in baluchistan again in pakistan makran is the uh, you know uh, sea coast it's a city on the sea coast that is the place uh, from where muhammad uh, bin qasim you know launched his maiden raid into bharatvarsha next you have a place called shilahatta which is today known as silhet it is in bangladesh next is kekaya the whole region was in afghanistan i mean it was lost long back then another country another desha is known as madra which is in pakistan madra is from where madri comes and the next is sawira uh, parts of this ancient region include today's multan original name of multan was mulasthana it had a uninterrupted unbroken sanctity as a great center of uh, pilgrimage a great tirthakshetra almost on par with kashi mathura kanchipuram banaras ayodhya today multan holds the record for having the maximum number of sufi shrines per square feet anywhere in the world and finally you have the sindhava desha parts of this region uh, this region are in sindh pakistan the sindhava was the other name given to jayadratha so only 12 of these regions i mean you can keep refining them small cities towns villages but you get the picture of the overall loss and uh, now we can come to the next slide uh ah, this is very interesting apart from the 56 uh, deshas and the 20 rivers you know and other famous uh, <coughs> method to divide or classify our jog our, our ancient geography was the well known system called the shodash mahajanapada or the 16 great republics which uh, were flourishing during the buddhist and early mauryan period even all the way till the uh, gupta period of these shodasha mahajanapadas we have permanently lost the following you can see that on the screen uh, we have lost kambhoja i just mentioned that we have lost gandhara we have lost kekaya we have lost madra and pushkalavati which was a great commercial town as well cultural and commercial town as well uh, it is it is also a vedic city iravatim devim pushkala pushkalavati maskabanu one one shloka goes like that so this pushkalavati uh, lies about 28 kilometers from what is today known as peshawar or purushapura it is also noteworthy that in their organization and their locations these shorash mahajanapadas also exhibit the same cultural and political continuity right from the days of uh, the vedas the ramayana mahabharata and uh, next we can look at perhaps uh, a brief list of perhaps the most important cultural and civilizational loss this is the loss of our tirthakshetras or places of pilgrimage 
I'll read out a brief list. Obviously, I can't give the entire list. Apart from a few names, we cannot recognize any of this. You know, I've kind of uh, tried to dig through and trace their original names or their modern names, as the case may be. They are all untraceable. So this is what I found, and it's a, a partial list. Uh, there's a city called, there's a Tirtha Kshetra called Apaga. Apa means water, so it's kind of eponymously named. Apaga, it was a famous Tirtha Kshetra on the bank of the Sindhu River. Now it is in Sayal Court and it is no longer a Tirtha Kshetra for obvious reasons. And in fact, until I did research for this topic, I had no idea that such a place even existed. Next, you have a place called Arjikiya. This also is a Vedic river uh, that uh, occurs in the Nadi Sukta, which I mentioned. Arjikiya is now called Haro, H A R O, which can mean anything. And it is in uh, Khaibar Pakhtunma. Next, you have something called the Bhimayasthanam. Now it's called the Takht e Bahai. It's in Peshawar. Next, you have Devika, which was a Nadi Kshetra, now near Multan. Gomati, I mentioned this, Gomal, Afghanistan. Khladin, it, is in the, it was in the KK Desha, which again now belongs to Pakistan, uh, sorry, Afghanistan. The river Iravati, a Tirtha Kshetra on its bank, it is completely in Lahore. Krumu, I mentioned this also, has become transformed as Kurram, Kuba, the Rigvedic river from which the name of the city Kabul is derived. Mujavat, this is very interesting actually. Mujavat is the name of a mountain range or a region, you know, mountainous region. The Mujavat Parvata, this is as old as the Rigvedic uh, 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 period. The Mujavat Parvata is, was the place where the soma plant grew in abundance. When you say soma yaga, soma yagna. So that was the original home where the soma plant grew in Mujavat Parvata. Even today, symbolically, we offer, you know, as uh, when you're doing any havan or uh, yagnam or yaga, you just symbolically offer the soma as ghee or something like that. Originally, people used to there were entire teams organized to climb the Mujavat Parvata, pick up, you know, Soma and then come all the way to the uh, Yagnashala. And there used to be mock arguments as to who gets the first right to, you know, uh, offer uh, Soma into the Yaga. All that is completely destroyed. Even within what the India that survives, this is gone. Uh, anyway, Mujavat Parvata is now on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So I've just given a list of only 10 such names and the number is easily in hundreds. So I think, uh, you know, if one of you is interested, you can pursue this uh, 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 topic. So, but when we consider the fact that the total area of Pakistan and Bangladesh includes about 30% of the land mass of undivided India, you can kind of uh, quantify the magnitude of this loss. Now, the loss of these substantial number of Tirtha Kshetras is not an ordinary loss. It is a fundamental civilization, cultural and spiritual loss. In fact, it's an all encompassing loss. And it throws an extremely important light to fully understand to truly understand the forgotten geography of Bharata Varsha. So what is the picture we get today when we think of all these lost sacred spaces, of all these lost Tirtha Kshetras? This is the picture we get. We notice a total absence of any kind of sanctity in these regions. Sanctity for a higher spiritual ideal, sanctity towards our Devatas who no longer inhabit these places and there is absolutely no reverence for something as basic as nature 
in all these places. Let us consider a routine example to illustrate the magnitude of this loss. Let's take a look at something all of us are familiar with and you know we all routinely use at our homes, Panchangam or the Hindu calendar. Now what is the basic function of a Panchangam? I mean apart from giving details about Titi Mahurat and so on, the Panchangam also gives extremely important geographical details. Specifically, it gives, you know, it is a beautiful combination, beautiful amalgam of space and time. Specifically, it gives details about our festivals, utsavams, celebrations and, you know, other uh, events that are conducted at various Tirtha Kshetras across Bharata Varsha. We use the Mysore Panchangam at my house. I'm from Bangalore. So that is a standard Panchangam. Now this Mysore Panchangam, it gives elaborate details about Utsavas in far off places like Ujjaini, Kashi, Mathura, Prayag, Gaya, Ayodhya and you know a host of other such holy places. Or for example, when you travel to the north, I think the standard Panchangam is the Nirnaya Sagar Panchangam, if I'm not mistaken. And that also gives details of festivals and sacred occasions in places like Kanchipuram, Tirupati, Rameshwaram and so on. You see at what all levels this country was united or is united. But anyway, but today it would be surprising to know that the Panchangams that were written just before the partition of India, 1947, before the partition of India, included similar details about festivals and utsavas uh, in Hindu Tirtha Kshetras, which are now in Pakistan and Bangladesh. You don't see them now in any other Panchangams. And so we must ask ourselves this fundamental question. Have these places in Pakistan remained as Tirtha Kshetras today? The spontaneous answer is no. And what has been the civilizational, cultural and the sheer Hindu human cost of this permanent loss? You all know the answer. So, what this points to is that this story of forgetting history due to the loss of geography also occurs in the change of names. This is a point I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this name change is in the realm of not only just places, but people, tribes, flora, fauna, and so on. So the, you know, one loss, loss of geography leads to all-encompassing loss. That's the point. And in the case of Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh and uh, large parts of India as well, this is even more glaring. In fact, one of the immediate things that happens after a peaceful invasion is how the event purposefully erases all traces of a Hindu past. And so, as we have seen so far, the Panchanada Kshetra later became to be called Punjab. This Punjab is one of the cradles of Sanatana civilization and today it has largely unrecognizable names, that part which has gone to Pakistan. Indeed, I mean, this is so basic, I mean, what, at what all levels this occurs, the very region from which foreigners derived the name India, Sindhu, that entire region is in Pakistan, it is no longer in India. Both the region as well as the river. And uh, another area where, where this, these name changes, uh, you know, impact is that by the 8th century CE, horse trade, not in political horse trading, but real horse trading, which were used in wars, <laughs> real horses. So by the 8th century CE, 
horse trade in Bharata Varsha had been completely taken over by Arab Muslim merchants. Completely. The consequence of this was that the original Sanskrit names for various breeds of horses were replaced by their Arabic equivalents. Which brings me to the next item. This is the major commercial, urban, educational and cultural centers that we have permanently lost to Pakistan and Afghanistan. So, as you can see, I have called this the Grand uh, Route. I hope the map is, uh, uh, you know, visible. Now, it's really quite incredible and it's also tragic when we recall today the fact that there was something called the Grand Trading Route or the Grand Route in Northern India, including Afghanistan and, and the Pakistan region. And this Grand Route was a commercial and cultural artery for a vast landmass covering the whole of Asia. From the Caspian Sea to the borders of China, from Balhika or Bactria to Pataliputra. In fact, uh, uh, when you go, uh, when you travel eastwards, you know, Pataliputra today or Patna is in Bihar. When you, from Bihar, from Pataliputra, when you travel all the way to Bengal, there is a port, a flourishing historic port known as Tamralipti. It is called uh, today uh, Tamlud, if I'm not mistaken. So this Tamralipti, the name Tamralipti it derived its name from Tamra or copper. It was the world's largest port, you know, importing and uh, rather exporting copper. Tamralipti was also the port uh, which had a high, highly active trade and commerce with the whole of Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. That was where Ashoka sent his uh, son and daughter Sangamitra to spread the uh, Bauddha Dharma. So this was Tamralipti and it is not coincidental that the Hindustan Copper Company still has a factory near Tamralipti. So look at the, uh, you know, the expanse and the extent of these things. Now, just to illustrate, you know, how this worked, I'll give you one small example. Uh, in Arthashastra, Chanakya mentions an important commercial sector in this grand route. He calls it the Haimavat Patha or the Himalayan sector. We can also call it the Balhika or the Takshashila sector. In general, here are some of the flourishing business centers along the grand route that he mentions, that Kautila mentions. Um, I'll read out uh, some of them. Pushkalavati, again, I mentioned that it is near Peshawar. Takshashila, which is in Pakistan, Mulasthana, Multan. Harahora, the place called Herat in Afghanistan. Uh, Kohat, Kohat is a place which had about 7% Hindu population even in the 1920s, most of which was completely cleansed during the so-called Khilafat movement. So Kohat was a very, very prosperous uh, uh, trading uh, city. And the entire region of Sindh, Lahore, Karachi, uh, and Kapisha or Kapishi. Now, uh, after this, we can look at some uh, highlights about the eminent people, uh, some educational and other aspects of this forgotten lost geography of Bharata Varsha. Let's look at some of the names, uh, only topmost names Maharshi Panini, Acharya Chanakya, Ashwaghosha, Nagasena. He is the author of the famous. Milinda Panha or Milinda Panho, Vasubandhu, Jivaka, Jivaka was incidentally Gautama Buddha's doctor, and Charaka, Charaka Samhita. So these are all the pioneers of the Indian civilization. You cannot imagine Sanskrit language without Panini. You cannot imagine Indian statecraft without Kautilya. You cannot imagine an Indian medical system without Charaka. I have just given some representative names and uh, these were basically the original sculptors of our civilization, society and culture. But on a larger point, apart from people, look at what has all happened. 
the entire northwestern region or the lost geography of bharata varsha this region was also a great center of samaveda and atharva veda learning so when we say northwest the question also arises northwest of what the obvious answer northwest of the bharata varsha that survives today only one branch of the atharva veda remains in truncated bharata varsha forget pakistan and afghanistan only in india that has survived only one branch of atharva veda has survived all the other eight branches have vanished simply because they had been preserved in that region that we have lost and uh, the jaimini branch of the samaveda likewise was preserved in mostly in sindh and gujarat and according to some estimates there were about 1000 branches of the samaveda and only 3 have remained in the india that remains for centuries uh, the sindh and the northwestern region also had vibrant contact with kashmir which was perhaps in its heydays during the time of Ananda Vardhana, Abhinava Gupta, Yashoda Varman, all these people. During the hey days, Kashmir was renowned as one of the world's greatest uh, learning centers and perhaps the most preeminent center of Sanskrit learning. And from the fragments of the surviving literature and other artifacts from the uh, originals, you know, this is very interesting. What am I about to say? lot of fragments and other artifacts which have been dis discovered in the original region of sindh these artifacts and literature they mention literally hundreds of poets and writers and scholars all of whom hailed from kashmir they were found in sindh and they mention you know they sing praises of uh, uh, you know the glory of uh, scholarly glory of uh, a uh, kashmir in fact saraswati namastubhyam varade kamarupini vidyaram see where she is from kashmira puravasini so and what is even more tragic is that almost no literary work that was composed in sindh has survived today not even one and from just what is available in the form of catalogs from just what is available we get a huge list of 500 plus scholars we just get their names scholars poets uh, you know of the highest standard who lived and flourished in sindh and hundreds of works on dharma shastras and other hindu legal treatises were composed in the sindh region but we don't have any record of them today not even their names we have to make conjectures you know scholars have made conjectures based on you know uh, other literature other sources now let's take the greatest names of them all maharshi panini panini didn't just you know wake up one day and write his magnificent grammar he mentions he clearly mentions in his ashtadhyayi that he patiently and diligently built upon a long and ancient parampara he mentions it that you know i am not writing this grammar afresh i owe a great debt of gratitude to all my purvasuris all the past masters upon whose shoulders i am standing on so anyway that's what he says and in the ashtadhyayi he mentions a huge list of geographical locations in india and to do that he divides the geography of his time into two parts one is all the regions to the east and all the regions to the west of the sindhu river the names of the majority of these uh, of 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 these places on this side on the other side that is on the pakistan side of the sindhu river have been erased forever there is a wonderful book india uh, in panini or india as seen in panini it's available in uh, archive.org very eye opening work and all these places on the side of pakistan have been erased forever and they have been replaced by 
unpronounceable names. Lahore, for example, was a great and a famous center of Sanskrit learning even during the pre-independence period. One of the legendary Sanskrit scholars and literateurs, he also won the Gnanapit Prize. He was awarded Padma Bhushan, Vidya Vachaspati, Professor Satyavarat Shastri. He took his early Sanskrit training in Lahore. Even in the, this is unbelievable also, even in the 1950s, the Arya Samaj had made Lahore as one of its most active hubs. Now, after this, we can come to this side, the region known, formerly known as East Pakistan, now known as Bangladesh. For endless centuries, this region was a great center of Sanskrit learning and literature. And, uh, you know, the contribution of the Pala and the uh, Sena kingdoms, their legacy to, you know, fostering this climate of learning and uh, uh, literature is extraordinary. I'll give a small example. There was a Sanskrit poet named Sridharadasa. He wrote a wonderful work called Sadukti Karanamrita. Then there was another talented uh, poet. His name is Vidyakara. He wrote a work called Subhashita Ratnakosha. Both of them hailed from the Vangadesha or what is known as Bangladesh and including West Bengal in India today. From these two works, we get an extraordinary list of 300 plus poets, writers, scholars, and jurists whom they have praised. You know, these, there was a certain standard. If you have to attain the standard of someone like Sri Dharadasa, you have to be somewhere there first because he starts there. So if he praises these, uh, list, gives a list of these uh, 300 poets and writers whom he holds in esteem, it is something else. Of these 300 plus names, all we have now are only a handful of individual verses. We don't know their names at all. Not a single work has survived in full. So keeping an average of one work per poet, you should have at least 300 full length works. Or, you know, at least 500. Not even one work has survived in full. You get fragmentary verses and scholars are still fighting for the authorship of that one verse that has survived. And this entire destruction, this appalling destruction, was the single-handed work of just one man. His name is Bhaktiyar Khalji. And today, we have the great fortune of having a railway station named in this honor, Bhakti Arthur. And uh, yeah, well, with that, uh, we can come to the concluding part of this session. Now, uh, one of the things that struck me when I was, you know, researching this topic is that after the second century CE, we have almost zero primary sources to reconstruct the Hindu history of this region with any accuracy until the 8th century. That is 600 years of cruel, tragic silence. Not a single Hindu work has survived in that entire region, you know, using which we can reconstruct that. And so by the 7th or the 8th century, this region had stopped producing the best works of the Sanatana genius. And after the 8th century, the majority sources of the history of these regions are written by the Muslim chroniclers of that period and we all know how those alleged histories read. Uh, anyway, now in spite of all this, we are actually stunned at the extraordinary resilience of the Hindu spirit of resistance when we read even the relatively recent history of this region. First, obviously, was a resurgence that uh, was pioneered by uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji. 
and then by the marathas and later by maharaja ranjit singh ranjit singh reconquered extensive territories in northwestern india including peshawar and large parts of afghanistan after more than 600 years of uninterrupted islamic rule this is resilience now we can also look at this from another perspective here is a very revealing quote from uh, the towering historian one of the rishis of our time shri sita ram goel and i quote him today there are no hindu jain buddhist temples or monuments or zoroastrian fire temples in the central asian republics of the ussr and sinkiang in china in makran siestan and the entire afghanistan which was honeycombed with temples before the advent of islam what new temples were built during the sikh and british rule in today's pakistan and bangladesh are fast vanishing the same is happening in kashmir in independent india sitaram ji wrote this in 1993 so about 31 years and uh, this is another way to understand the different facets the different multiple dimensions of the forgotten hindu history of pakistan or the lost geography of bharatvarsha same coin two sides so there are two quick methods that you know i could think of i could be wrong but you know there could be other methods but this is like a quick uh, uh, back of the envelope uh, solution one is to notice the state of hindu temples and other you know sanatana based monuments in pakistan afghanistan bangladesh notice the present state of these temples and you know investigate their past second is to read the full list of unesco world heritage sites in this lost geography of bharatvarsha when we read this list we immediately notice the fact that most of them are located precisely in the region where the islamic conquest of bharatvarsha first occurred it is not a coincidence at all and then when we read the history of something as recent as a freedom struggle it is common to see names like sindh lahore karachi uh, rawalpindi sialkot and so on in the same way that we today takes the take the names of say chennai mumbai bangalore bhopal delhi uh, chandigarh and so on all these cities and towns now which are now in pakistan were also great centers of a freedom struggle for example lala lajpat rai rajguru bhagat singh and sukhdev sukhdev all of them died in lahore and the number of nationalist and patriotic publications it could be newspapers magazines periodicals published from regions and cities and towns which are now in pakistan is also significant for the longest time you know major international publishers like penguin and you know allen unwin all, all these guys macmillan they boasted of having large offices and uh, centers in karachi and lahore what is the scene today they took these names with the same pride as, as they said that you know we also have offices in london and new york what is the fate today anyway so this is significant and in fact in those days during the freedom struggle it was considered prestigious if a business house had branches in both bombay and karachi why because there was unfettered sea access from bombay to karachi and you know i can cite hundreds of such examples but the important most important point to remember is this something called islamabad did not exist before 1960 it did not what does that tell us about the forgotten hindu history of pakistan 
a city, a new capital built from the scratch named after Islam. And uh, finally, there is a common sense reason and also an urgent need to learn and keep this lost geography of Bharata Varsha in our active memory. Now, it is understandable. It is understandable that Pakistan does not teach the history of its Hindu past, obviously. It is due to the founding ideology and its state religion which portrays this brutal erasure of its Hindu past as a victory over a dark infidel faith. That is understandable. But for India, it is a civilizational imperative for what remains of Bharata Varsha. We have to teach and remember this Hindu history of Pakistan. And even in this case, even in this case, the educational system of Pakistan shows us, gives us a you know, guideline. It's a great uh, path-breaking um, guidance that Pakistan's education system shows. Now, there was an interesting academic report uh, um, that was published in Pakistan in the year uh, 2008 or 2009. It is an assessment, it is a report about the state of textbooks in Pakistan. That report has an interesting data point about how chemistry is taught to school children. Chemistry, not history. Chemistry. So Pakistani children are taught about the chemical composition of water in the following manner, and I quote, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen come together and by the grace of Allah, water is formed. Unless we learn and remember this forgotten history, Hindu history of Pakistan, our kids, our children here in India, sometime in the future, will have textbooks written like this. And it is my firm conviction that if this endeavor of studying the lost geography of Bharata Varsha is undertaken with the seriousness that it merits, it will be nothing short of national service. And like I said, it has a potential to run up into multiple volumes. And on that note, I'm once again grateful to the Vande Mataram team here and IIT Madras for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts on a subject so vital to the preservation of our civilizational heritage. Thank you and namaste. Uh, it, is, it is also a Vedic city. Iravatim, Devim, Pushkala, Pushkalavati, Maskabanu, one, one shloka goes like that. So this Pushkalavati uh, lies about 28 kilometers from what is today known as Peshawar or Purushapura. It is also noteworthy that in their organization and their locations, these Shorasha Mahajanapadas also exhibit the same cultural and political continuity. Right from the days of uh, the Vedas, the Ramayana, Mahabharata. And uh, next we can look at perhaps uh, a brief list of perhaps the most important cultural and civilizational loss. This is the loss of our Tirthakshetras or places of pilgrimage. I read out a brief list, obviously I can't give the entire list. Apart from a few names, we cannot recognize any of this. You know, I've kind of uh, tried to dig through and trace their original names or their modern names as the case may be. They are all untraceable. So this is what I found and it's a, a partial list. Uh, there's a city called, there's a Tirtha Kshetra called Apaga, Apa means water, so it's kind of eponymously named. Apaga, it was a famous Tirtha Kshetra on the bank of the Sindhu river. Now it is in Sayal court and it is no longer a Tirtha Kshetra for obvious reasons. And in fact, until I did research for this topic, I had no idea that such a place even existed. Next, you have a place called Arjikiya. This also is a Vedic river 
that uh, occurs in the Nadi Sukta, which I mentioned. RG Kia is now called Haro, H A R O, which can mean anything. And it is in uh, Khyber Pakhtunma. Next, you have something called the Bhimayasthanam. Now it's called the Takht E Bhai. It's in Peshawar. Next, you have Devika, which was a Nadi Kshetra, now near Multan. Gomati, I mentioned this, Gomal, Afghanistan. Khladin, it is in the it was in the KK Desha, which again now belongs to Pakistan, uh, sorry, Afghanistan. The river Iravati, a Kshetra on its bank, it is completely in Lahore. Krumu, I mentioned this also, has become transformed as Kurram. Kuba, the Rigvedic river from which the name of the city Kabul is derived. Mujavat, this is very interesting actually. Mujavat, this the name of a mountain range or a region, you know, mountainous region. The Mujavat Parvata, this is as old as the Rigvedic uh, 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 period. The Mujavat Parvata is, was the place where the Soma plant grew in abundance. When you say Somayaga, Somayagna, so that was the original home where the Soma plant grew in Mujavat Parvata. Even today, symbolically, we offer, you know, as uh, when you're doing any havan or uh, yagnam or yaga, you just symbolically offer the soma as ghee or something like that. Originally, people used to, there were entire teams organized to climb the Mujavat Parvata, pick up, you know, soma and then come all the way to the uh, yagnashala. And there used to be mock arguments as to who gets the first right to, you know, uh, offer uh, a Soma into the Yaga. All that is completely destroyed. Even within what the India that survives, this is gone. Uh, anyway, Mujavat Parvata is now on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So I've just given a list of only 10 such names and the number is easily in hundreds. So I think, uh, you know, if one of you is interested, you can pursue this uh, 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 topic. So, but when we consider the fact that the total area of Pakistan and Bangladesh includes about 30% of the land mass of undivided India, you can kind of uh, quantify the magnitude of this loss. Now, the loss of these substantial number of Tirtha Kshetras is not an ordinary loss. It is a fundamental civilization, cultural and spiritual loss. In fact, it's an all encompassing loss. And it throws an extremely important light to fully understand, to truly understand the forgotten geography of Bharata Varsha. So what is the picture we get today when we think of all these lost sacred spaces? of all these lost Tirtha Kshetras. This is a picture we get. We notice a total absence of any kind of sanctity in these regions. Sanctity for a higher spiritual ideal, sanctity towards our devatas who no longer inhabit these places and there is absolutely no reverence for something as basic as nature in all these places. Let us consider a routine example to illustrate the magnitude of this loss. Let's take a look at something all of us are familiar with and you know we all routinely use at our homes, Panchangam or the Hindu calendar. Now what is the basic function of a Panchangam? I mean apart from giving details about Tithi, Mahurat and so on, the Panchangam also gives extremely important geographical details. Specifically, it gives, you know, it is a beautiful combination, beautiful amalgam of space and time. Specifically, it gives details about our festivals, utsavams, celebrations and, you know, other uh, events that are conducted at various Tirtha Kshetras across Bharata Varsha. 
we use the Mysore Panchangam at my house. I'm from Bangalore. So that is a standard Panchangam. Now, this Mysore Panchangam, it gives elaborate details about Utsavas in far off places like Ujjaini, Kashi, Mathura, Prayag, Gaya, Ayodhya, and you know, a host of other such holy places. Or, for example, when you travel to the north, I think the standard Panchangam is the Nirnaya Sagar Panchangam, if I'm not mistaken. And that also gives details of festivals and sacred occasions in places like Kanchipuram, Tirupati, Rameshwaram and so on. You see at what all levels this country was united or is united. But anyway, but today it would be surprising to know that the Panchangams that were written just before the partition of India, 1947, before the partition of India, included similar details about festivals and utsavas uh, in Hindu Tirtha Kshetras, which are now in Pakistan and Bangladesh. You don't see them now in any of the Panchangans. And so we must ask ourselves this fundamental question. Have these places in Pakistan remained as Tirtha Kshetras today? The spontaneous answer is no. And what has been the civilizational, cultural, and the sheer Hindu human cost of this permanent loss? You all know the answer. So, what this points to is that this story of forgetting history due to the loss of geography also occurs in the change of names. This is a point I mentioned earlier. Uh, and this name change is in the realm of not only just places, but people, tribes, flora, fauna, and so on. So the, you know, one loss, loss of geography leads to all encompassing loss. That's the point. And in the case of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, and uh, large parts of India as well, this is even more glaring. In fact, one of the immediate things that happens after a peaceful invasion is how the event purposefully erases all traces of a Hindu past. And so, as we have seen so far, the Panchanada Kshetra later became to be called Punjab. This Punjab is one of the cradles of Sanatana civilization and today, it has largely unrecognizable names, that part which has gone to Pakistan. Indeed, I mean, this is so basic, I mean, what, at what all levels this occurs, the very region from which foreigners derived the name India, Sindhu, that entire region is in Pakistan, it is no longer in India. Both the region as well as the river, And uh, another area where, where this, these name changes, uh, you know, impact is that by the 8th century CE, horse trade, not in political horse trading, but real horse trading, which were used in wars, <laughs> real horses. So by the 8th century CE, horse trade in Bharata Varsha had been completely taken over by Arab Muslim merchants, completely. The consequence of this was that the original Sanskrit names for various breeds of horses were replaced by their Arabic equivalents. Which brings me to the next item. This is the major commercial, urban, educational and cultural centers that we have permanently lost to Pakistan and Afghanistan. So. As you can see, I've called this the grand uh, route. I hope the map is, uh, uh, you know, visible. Now, it's really quite incredible and it's also tragic when we recall today the fact that there was something called the grand trading route or the grand route 
in northern india including afghanistan and and the pakistan region and this grand route was a commercial and cultural artery for a vast landmass covering the whole of asia from the caspian sea to the borders of china from balhika or bactria to pataliputra in fact uh, uh, when you go uh, when you travel eastwards you know pataliputra today or patna is in bihar when you from bihar from pataliputra when you travel all the way to bengal there is a port a flourishing historic port known as tamralipti it is called uh, today uh, tamlud if i am not mistaken so this tamralipti the name tamralipti it derived its name from tamra or copper it was the world's largest port you know importing and uh, rather exporting copper tamralipti was also the port uh, which had a high highly active trade and commerce with the whole of southeast asia and sri lanka that was where ashoka sent his uh, son and daughter sangamitra to spread the bauddha dharma so this was tamralipti and it is not coincidental that the hindustan copper company still has a factory near tamralipti so look at the uh, you know the expanse and the extent of these things now just to illustrate you know how this worked i'll give you one small example uh, in arthashastra chanakya mentions an important commercial sector in this grand route he calls it the haimavath patha or the himalayan sector we can also call it the balhika or the takshashila sector in general here are some of the flourishing business centers along the grand route that he mentions that kautila mentions um, i'll read out uh, some of them pushkalavati again i mentioned that it is near peshawar takshashila which is in pakistan mulasthana multan harahora the place called herat in afghanistan uh kohat kohat is a place which had about 7% hindu population even in the 1920s most of which was completely cleansed during the so called khilafat movement so kohat was a very very prosperous uh, uh, trading uh, city and the entire region of sindh lahore karachi uh, and kapisha or kapishi now uh, after this we can look at some uh, highlights about the eminent people uh, some educational and other aspects of this forgotten lost geography of bharatavarsha let's look at some of the names uh, only top most names maharshi panini acharya chanakya ashwaghosha nagasena he is author of the famous milinda panha or milinda panho vasubandhu jivaka jivaka was incidentally gautama buddha's doctor and charaka charaka samhita so these are all the pioneers of the indian civilization you cannot imagine sanskrit language without panini you cannot imagine indian state craft without kautilya you cannot imagine an indian medical system without charaka i have just given some representative names and uh, these were basically the original sculptors of our civilization society and culture but on a larger point apart from people look at what has all happened the entire northwestern region or the lost geography of bharatavarsha this region was also a great center of samaveda and atharva veda learning so when we say northwest the question also arises northwest of what the obvious answer northwest of the bharatavarsha that survives today only one branch of the atharva veda remains in truncated bharatavarsha forget pakistan and afghanistan only in india that has survived only one branch of atharva veda has survived all the other eight branches have vanished simply because they had been preserved in that region that we have lost and uh, 
the Jaimini branch of the Sama Veda likewise was preserved in mostly in Sindh and Gujarat. And according to some estimates, there were about 1000 branches of the Sama Veda and only three have remained in the India that remains. For centuries, uh, the Sindh and the Northwestern region also had vibrant contact with Kashmir, which was perhaps in its heydays during the time of Anandavardhana, Abhinava Gupta, Yeshovarman, all these people. During the heydays, Kashmir was renowned as one of the world's greatest uh, learning centers and perhaps the most preeminent center of Sanskrit learning. And from the fragments of the surviving literature and other artifacts from the uh, original, you know, this is very interesting what I'm about to say. Lot of fragments and other artifacts which have been dis discovered in the original region of Sindh. These artifacts and literature, they mention literally hundreds of poets and writers and scholars, all of whom hailed from Kashmir. They were found in Sindh. And they mention, you know, they sing praises of, uh, uh, you know, the glory of, uh, scholarly glory of uh, uh, Kashmir. In fact, Saraswati Namastubhyam Varade Kamarupini. Vidyaram, see, where she is from? Kashmira Puravasini. So, and what is even more tragic is that almost no literary work that was composed in Sindh has survived today. Not even one. And from just what is available in the form of catalogs, from just what is available, we get a huge list of 500 plus scholars. We just get their names. Scholars, poets, uh, you know, of the highest standard who lived and flourished in Sindh. And hundreds of works on Dharma Shastras and other Hindu legal treatises were composed in the Sindh region, but we don't have any record of them today. Not even their names. We have to make conjectures, you know, scholars have made conjectures based on, you know, uh, other literature, other sources. Now, let's take the greatest names of them all. Maharshi Panini. Panini didn't just, you know, wake up one day and write his magnificent grammar. He mentions, he clearly mentions in his Ashtadhyayi that he patiently and diligently built upon a long and ancient parampara. He mentions it. That, you know, I am not writing this grammar afresh. I owe a great debt of gratitude to all my Purvasuris, all the past masters upon whose shoulders I am standing on. So, anyway, that's what he says. And in the Ashtadhyayi, he mentions a huge list of geographical locations in India. And to do that, he divides the geography of his time into two parts. One is all the regions to the east and all the regions to the west of the Sindhu River. The names of the majority of these, uh, of, of, of these places on this side, on the other side, that is on the Pakistan side of the Sindhu River, have been erased forever. There is a wonderful book, India uh, in Panini or India as seen in Panini. It's available in uh, archive.org, very eye-opening work. And all these places on the side of Pakistan have been erased forever and they have been replaced by unpronounceable names. Lahore, for example, was a great and a famous center of Sanskrit learning even during the pre-independence period. One of the legendary Sanskrit scholars and literateurs, he also won the Gnanapit Prize. He was awarded Padma Bhushan, Vidya Vachaspati, Professor Satyavarat Shastri. He took his early Sanskrit training in Lahore. Even in the, this is unbelievable also, even in the 1950s, the Arya Samaj had made Lahore as one of its most active hubs. Now, after this, we can come to this side, 
the region known formerly known as east pakistan now known as bangladesh for endless centuries this region was a great center of sanskrit learning and literature and uh, you know the contribution of the pala and the uh, sena kingdoms their legacy to you know fostering this climate of learning and uh, uh, literature is extraordinary i'll give a small example there was a sanskrit poet named shridharadasa he wrote a wonderful work called sadukti karanamrita then there was another talented uh, poet his name is vidyakara he wrote a work called subhashita ratnakosha both of them hailed from the vangadesha or what is known as bangladesh and including west bengal in india today from these two works we get an extraordinary list of 300 plus poets writers scholars and jurists whom they have praised you know these there was a certain standard if you have to attain the standard of someone like shridhar dasa you have to be somewhere there first because he starts there he praises these uh, list gives a list of these uh, 300 poets and writers whom he holds in esteem it is something else of these 300 plus names all we have now are only a handful of individual verses we don't know their names at all not a single work has survived in full so keeping an average of one work per poet you should have at least 300 full length works or you know at least 500 not even one work has survived in full you get fragmentary verses and scholars are still fighting for the authorship of that one verse that has survived and this entire destruction this appalling destruction was the single handed work of just one man his name is bakhtiyar khalji and today we have the great fortune of having a railway station named in this honor bakhtiyar and uh, yeah well with that uh, we can come to the concluding part of this session now uh, one of the things that struck me when i was you know researching this topic is that after the second century ce we have almost zero primary sources to reconstruct the hindu history of this region with any accuracy until the 8th century that is 600 years of cruel tragic silence not a single hindu work has survived in that entire region you know using which we can reconstruct that and so by the 7th or the 8th century this region had stopped producing the best works of the sanatana genius and after the 8th century the majority sources of the history of these regions are written by the muslim chroniclers of that period and we all know how those alleged histories read uh, anyway now in spite of all this we are actually stunned at the extraordinary resilience of the hindu spirit of resistance when we read even the relatively recent history of this region first obviously was a resurgence that uh, was pioneered by uh, chhatrapati shivaji and then by the marathas and later by maharaja ranjit singh ranjit singh reconquered extensive territories in northwestern india including peshawar and large parts of afghanistan after more than 600 years of uninterrupted islamic rule this is resilience now we can also look at this from another perspective here is a very revealing quote from uh, the towering historian one of the rishis of our time shri sita ram goel and i quote him today there are no hindu jain buddhist temples or monuments or zoroastrian fire temples in the central asian republics of the ussr and sinkiang in china in makran 
Siestan, and the entire Afghanistan, which was honeycombed with temples before the advent of Islam. What new temples were built during the Sikh and British rule in today's Pakistan and Bangladesh are fast vanishing. The same is happening in Kashmir in independent India. Sita Ramji wrote this in 1993. It's about 31 years. And uh, this is another way to understand the different facets, the different multiple dimensions of the forgotten Hindu history of Pakistan or the lost geography of Bharata Varsha. Same coin, two sides. So there are two quick methods that, you know, I could think of. I could be wrong, but, you know, there could be other methods, but this is like a quick uh, uh, back of the envelope uh, solution. One is to notice the state of Hindu temples and other, you know, Sanatana based monuments in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh. Notice the present state of these temples and, you know, investigate their past. Second is to read the full list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites in this lost geography of Bharat Varsha. When we read this list, we immediately notice the fact that most of them are located precisely in the region where the Islamic conquest of Bharata Varsha first occurred. It is not a coincidence at all. And then, when we read the history of something as recent as a freedom struggle, it is common to see names like Sindh, Lahore, Karachi, uh, Rawalpindi, Sialkot and so on in the same way that we today takes the, take the names of say Chennai, Mumbai, Bangalore, Bhopal, Delhi, uh, Chandigarh and so on. All these cities and towns now which are now in Pakistan were also great centers of a freedom struggle. For example, Lala Lajpat Rai, Rajguru, Bhagat Singh and Sakhdev Sukhdev, all of them died in Lahore. And the number of nationalist and patriotic publications, it could be newspapers, magazines, periodicals, published from regions and cities and towns which are now in Pakistan is also significant. For the longest time, you know, major international publishers like Penguin and, you know, Alan Unwin, all, all these guys, Macmillan, they boasted of having large offices and uh, centers in Karachi and Lahore. What is the scene today? They took these names with the same pride as, as they said that, you know, we also have offices in London and New York. What is the fate today anyway? So this is significant. And in fact, in those days, during the freedom struggle, it was considered prestigious if a business house had branches in both Bombay and Karachi. Why? Because there was unfettered sea access from Bombay to Karachi. And you know, I can cite hundreds of such examples, but the important, most important point to remember is this. Something called Islamabad did not exist before 1960. It did not. What does that tell us about the forgotten Hindu history of Pakistan? A city, a new capital built from the scratch named after Islam. And uh, finally, there is a common sense reason and also an urgent need to learn and keep this lost geography of Bharata Varsha in our active memory. Now, it is understandable it is understandable that Pakistan does not teach the history of its Hindu past, obviously. It is due to the founding ideology and its state religion, which portrays this brutal erasure of its Hindu past as a victory over a dark, infidel faith. That is understandable. But for India, it is a civilizational imperative 
for what remains of bharata varsha we have to teach and remember this hindu history of pakistan and even in this case even in this case the educational system of pakistan shows us gives us a, you know guideline it's a great uh, path breaking um, guidance that pakistan's education system shows now there was an interesting academic report uh, um, that was published in pakistan in the year uh, 2008 or 2009 2009 it is a assessment it is a report about the state of textbooks in pakistan that report has an interesting data point about how chemistry is taught to school children chemistry not history chemistry so pakistani children are taught about the chemical composition of water in the following manner and i quote two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen come together and by the grace of allah water is formed unless we learn and remember this forgotten history hindu history of pakistan our kids our children here in india sometime in the future will have textbooks written like this and it is my firm conviction that if this endeavor of studying the lost geography of bharata varsha is undertaken with the seriousness that it merits it will be nothing short of national service and like i said it has a potential to run up into multiple volumes and on that note i am once again grateful to the vande mataram team here and iit madras for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts on a subject so vital to the preservation of our civilizational heritage thank you and namaste dhanyawad sir it was an insightful lecture indeed the political partition of bharat varsha that happened in 1947 so and was all encompassing loss now we'll open the floor for question and answers i request the audience to introduce themselves and uh, limit yourselves to one question in the interest of time Uh, sir uh, myself murli krishnan from chennai uh, sir uh, like you know what you told about panini like tolkapir also he is also praising uh, to his ancestors like in manar pulavar in tamil like what you have told about you know uh, panini praised about his ancestors like tolkapir also praised about his ancestors like in manar pulavar and then second question is like dakshashilam is in pakistan sir that what dakshashilam dakshashila is in pakistan yes my name is ravi kumar um, i understand how the hindu uh, history in pakistan has been systematically erased but what surprises me many times is the hindu uh, um, relation in indonesia for example is still retained although it's an islamic country so why do you think that the hindu uh, ancestry or hindu um, connection in uh, indonesia remains even to today in fact i in fact i met an indonesian student sometime back and his university photo showed the idol of uh, lord ganesha there and this is uh, in an islamic country like indonesia but that's not the case in the western part of india the current india but but the eastern part of uh, the uh, you know east side of india still the hindu ancestry remains for example recently i was visiting thailand i could see the hindu temples there of course thailand is a buddhist temple a buddhist country but but indonesia is a surprise to me any comments on that Yeah, I mean, this is a good question. You can just make a couple of conjectures, although you can't take this as a final word on the subject. Now, the Islamic character of Indonesia—it is overridden by the 
their Hindu cultural consciousness with which their people associate and identify it deeply. What has happened, uh, you can look at this phenomenon in multiple ways, but what has happened in Indonesia is that they love their puppetry, you know, Ramayana shows and their Wang Biber, this is an art form, uh, form of puppetry there. While they celebrate that with, you know, genuine uh, love and uh, devotion, their external, their daily life and customs are completely Islamic. So, Hinduism or Hindu Dharma is not a living tradition there. Islam is. So, it's a weird combination and uh, unlike say India which is so large and you know uh, so prosperous and therefore susceptible to multiple uh, bouts of attacks, Indonesia presents no such case. I hope that answers. Starting from, uh, say, Burma down to Bali, all the temples are built by the Cholas. Question, question, sir. No, no, just question. I'm adding to what oh. Professor said. Yeah. See, because Tamil is uh, Tamil language is listed by the UNESCO as the oldest language known to the mankind. Tamil history is also we erased. Can we can discuss this offline, please. No, no, Tamil history yeah. is lang also been vanished in many ways. See, not only in northern part, Sing Sri Lanka was part of India, I mean, Bharat in those days. They got freedom only after India in 1948. So they, are also, they also erase a lot of things. So what we can do about it now, northern past lost. I mean, it is not happened after 1947 partition. Because you were talking about uh, Sanskrit age, I mean, these all happened well before that. Partition has nothing to do with that. Good evening, sir. This is Avinash. I am an M.Tech student here. Thank you for the great lecture. I wanted to know that now that you have done so much research and I just wanted to know, are there any ways or means with which all these things are being brought back through where, where all, for example, I had interest so I came here. What are the other means where such things can be found out and what are the active, probably, pages or communities that are building upon it and trying to revive or probably at least uh, enlighten people about it. I think you can, uh, you know, if you're interested in communities and things like that, there are different websites uh, dedicated to doing this uh, full time. Uh, just search for uh, uh, Epigraphical Society of India. From there you will get many links to what you're looking for, if you're interested in this, this field. Epigraphic Society of India and uh, Mythic Society, there also you get a lot of this valuable material. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, myself, Kedar. I just wanted to know, uh, I remember an interview where Sarman Rashdi quoted that there might be the future chance in which reverse partition, not the political, but the sociological might happen. Uh, what do you think will the future look like after 50, 70 years? No, I'm not an astrologer, you know, I don't do this future predictions, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but w what do you think? Uh, no, I don't have an answer to this no, question. No, sociological. No, I, I don't even have a window into the next three years, the rate at which things are changing. So it will be untruthful on my part to answer something like this. Uh -huh. Namaste, sir. I am Ashish, PhD scholar in Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. So, sir, thanks for the talk. My question is, the places which are now still there, say, for example, Kates Raj is there it's still in Pakistan. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's active, but uh, Hinglaj Mata, which is a Shakti Peet, it is still active, like uh, pilgrims go there. So, my question is that the places which are still active, for example, Dhakeshwari and all, what can be done that, you know, these places are not wiped off, they, they remain. So, if there, is there anything that can be done in that regard? Unless, uh, you know, uh, unless 
government intervention in these areas is possible uh, i don't see much future because these things a things like temples and others should be kept alive by the local communities who have sufficient stake sufficient devotion sufficient interest in preserving the heritage of those temples now you see a lot of these uh, ruined temples in india itself forget hinglaj how many are being actively uh, maintained how many have you know nitya pujas the date goes to something called an asi it becomes a monument so meaning it's a lifeless piece of architecture visited by tourists not pilgrims so, they are same thing so you know this is a uh, unfortunate reality that nothing much can be done i mean how long will you will will can any government exert pressure on preserving you know hinglaj mata and dakeshwari temples especially in countries like that it's so unfortunate reality better we accept it and live with it thank you sir my name is vk shrinivasan uh now we know the what the old names of the places in the akan bharat so is it going to be a strategy for uh, nationalist people like us to start using the old names along with the current names to create a vis- awareness in the society for next some time actually that's a wonderful idea we should start doing whenever we write anything yeah right when yes. you say peshawar don't say Absolutely. peshawar allies purusha prama yes, yes, yes. 8th century yes yes like so wonderful like, idea like the like the um, uh, sharada beatam right now in pakistan occupied kashmir so uh, maybe we can come out with documents about all the honor and age shakti peters how many are within india and what are the old name where are which countries so the communication strategy is to propagate and relieve those moments and document forever now they are being removed systematically for the past 75 years in the country today can we recreate them together yeah, i think can we can do that some people are already doing it for example there some some folks write uh, karnavati instead of ahmedabad you know things like that that's yes. happening yeah renaming is one and you see in our day to day communication yeah. and uh, same same yes yeah same thing thank same. you Thank you sir for addressing the queries placed by the audience. I request Professor Arun Mahendarkar to present a token of gratitude and appreciation for our chief guest. Thank you Professor Arun Mahendarkar. I request Pro- Jiva to deliver the vote of thanks. Namaste. I like to register my sincere thanks and gratitude to our uh, chief guest uh, Shri Sandeep ji uh, for coming to our platform and addressing the audience extensively on the topic uh, the lost geography of the lost geography of India with lots of specifics. In a single sentence I would like to register this lecture as like Bharat reintroduced with its true glory. I would also like to thank the faculty members, staff, students and the entire IITM fraternity for joining us today for this lecture event. Thank you Jeeva. We hope to see you all in the next future events which will be soon. So those of you who are interested in volunteering and receiving updates regarding our future events please write to us at vandemataram@smail.iitm.ac.in So we have come to the end of the program but how is it complete without singing the national anthem So now I request everyone to stand up for the national anthem hmm. जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता 
पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल वंग विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्छल जलधि तरंग तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जनगण मंगलदायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे I request all the faculty members to join us for a group photograph and all the students also can join us. <laughs>